Hello to all my friends out there. Hi, you guys. Well, here we are again. Sometimes I do the videos in the car. Sometimes I do the videos in the uh, kitchen. When the weather gets nicer and when I finish cleaning up my uh, patio, I'll be doing some nice videos out on my nice, I have a really nice backyard. A little one, but it's nice. So I hope everyone is doing okay. And I found, this is the best tea if you can find this. Arnica chamomile and ginger. And it makes really, really good iced tea. I made four cups, so I have a little bit left. Okay, this video is three things I have learned over the years that's really going to help me in 2021, and it could really help you too. Okay, how I learned these things is years ago, I had to go to a self-help group. So what that means is you're supposed to get help for yourself, and then you're supposed to help other people. In fact, if you don't help other people, you can't stay helped. So that's a good incentive. So a lot of the things people are facing now are the things that unstable people used to face. You know, they would come in trying to get their lives together and they would have a zillion problems. So to get started... Okay, like when you have highly dysfunctional people, it's always... Things will get better in the future. Like when they, ra they were raised, well, as soon as your dad finds a job again, things will get better. As soon as, uh, you know, as soon as this sick person gets better, things will get better. So always before things will get better in the future. So uh, last year, you know, we were going, oh, you know, uh, as soon as, as this virus is over and you know it's a new year things are going to get better no they're not going to get better so what we have to do is we have to uh eliminate that things will get better kind of thinking and just start thinking okay it's not getting better it's getting worse so we're going to go through some things and then we're going to come back to these three points and we're going to examine them if you don't have a job, things will not get better until you have a job. If your job was considered non-essential last year, chances are it's not going to get any better. I told my son, my son went to college, and I go, okay, you have to treat finding a job like a full-time job, and then if you don't have a job, well, maybe you're going to, in six months, maybe you're going to have to work at SeaWorld. Guess what? You can't work at SeaWorld now. So if you can't, if you can't work, if you can't find a job doing what you're doing, you have to find a job. I've seen some rather prosperous looking uh, people driving for Uber. So you have to say, okay, I remember Hillary, get a job, get a better job. Like um, people who are sober. I remember um, this one girl, the one I took through the food bank. She would ring the bell for the Salvation Army. Guess what? Now, because of the corona, they don't have a lot of those kind of jobs, seasonal jobs. Also, they're uh, cutting jobs to part-time, which leads you to underemployment. So in my life, when that started happening, I had to work two and three jobs. Or you have to find a better job. So it might be that you have to create your own job. Okay, I've showed you, you might go, I can't create my own job. You have to, it's much better to work for yourself. Okay, an example would be, see this lovely shirt? I bought this, I bought six of these last week for $1 each. So $6, I could sell these at the swap meet for $3. That would only, would only give me like $18.00. Minus six would be $12. But when this kind of stuff becomes valuable is when you have 3,000 items, 5,000 items, like, you know, the jewelry. And here's two of the rings that I sell. My idea was to sell this kind of stuff when I first started. And then I started, and these, these necklaces would be $3. Um, if I needed to, I could cash out this, um, 
umbrella for three dollars and these cute shoes for three dollars so it's like stockpiling the food say if you sell one item then you buy two and in time your inventory is going to grow and so when i retire my idea was to do the swap meet but the coronavirus kind of messed that up but it's always a possibility and then you know i sell stuff on ebay but the trick is to find brand new stuff and find it cheap okay things and then we're going to go through these things will get better in the future but they never did it was always this idea this way of thinking and so if you are creating situations that are not getting better or if other people or governments or whatever companies are creating situations then you have to say okay how many times am I going to put up with this? Someday things are going to get better. Oh, you're going to give half my job to your friend who doesn't have a job and I am going to work part-time? That happened to me many times. This was after I put the job in, mind you. Number one, things will get better in the future. Okay, my ex-husband, this is number two. My ex-husband was a printer. And they would print things on paper. And if you didn't pay your paper bill, you couldn't have paper. You had to get your paper on COD. But you didn't have enough money for the paper until you printed the job. But you have, hadn't paid your paper bill, so you couldn't get paper without cash. And you couldn't get cash without printing the work on paper. So you see the problem? So if you're working for these kind of people, this is not a good situation for you. You can't pay me if you can't get your paper, if you can't print your job, or if you can't pay your bills and I have a cash money uh, business, or if your relative or friend needs my apartment, you can bet what is gonna happen. So this concept of, of um, it's an idea, uh, an example would be the paper. This person cannot earn money because they did not pay their bills, basically. So keep that in mind. So you don't want to work for those kind of people. I did. I would work two and three of them because I would know eventually they would, they would have. That gets us into the next one. Okay, let's say you and i are working in the same shop next to each other you don't have any money and you have to fire me so you can take my cash money business so you might ask yourself well why is it that you don't just build a cash money business well there's a million excuses i have to pay the overhead i think we should take credit um, I want to I wanna hire my friend and pay her $60 a day and give her your work. So the thing about this is your underlying problem is the way you think about doing business. And that, there is a, they make a good point in reincarnation. The present is caused by, now they say the past in a past life, but you could think about it as your past has created your present so okay most of the time like in my job my job was unstable for a long time you know i could see it i didn't want to buy my own shop because i didn't want to pay overhead because i would be standing on my feet doing hair forever just to get back to zero and i wanted to be hit pay if i made ten dollars i wanted to be paid five six seven eight dollars so um, everything, so like say 2020, if someone said your job is non-essential, that is not a good job. You have to say to yourself, well, I have to approach finding a new job. You know, out here, uh, one of the options was work. Well, I can always work for the casino, really? Not always, your best bet is some kind of self-employment. Like what? Well, it depends what you can do. I worked in good areas and their jobs were landscapers, pool cleaners, construction. You know, they made it a point so that they became contractors, generally working for um, themselves. So the third, the third concept is right now is a result 
of the past. Maybe not anything you did, maybe, you know, the people you were working for. Okay, so now let's go through some issues we might be, be facing. Okay, now this points to a depression, a widening gap between the rich getting rich and the poor people getting poor. So if you exist on money given to you by the government, that is the poverty level. And we all know that, right? And if anything, uh, if anything disrupts that, then you're really screwed. But there is this widening gap between the rich and the poor. So the poor are going to, you know, uh, there's unemployment, social security, disability, uh, retirements, all these things that rely on other people, right? You know, and um, so if you're in that group, how are is the government or the country going to get more money, it's taxes. They're gonna raise taxes. And you go, I don't like it. Well, where are they gonna get the money to pay out these social services? That is why a lot of people are fleeing from California. We're gonna get into the migration thing in a minute. So you see this widening gap between the rich and the poor. So now let's see, things will get better in the future for the rich, but if you're somewhere between the rich and the poor, you can expect higher taxes. You can take that to the bank. You have to start making adjustments for the higher tax. Okay, this is to do like with credit. If you can't pay your bills and you can't pay your paper, you can't get paper, so this concept if you don't have any credit because you didn't pay your bills. And then looking to the third item is today is a result of the past. So if you're getting poorer and poorer and poorer, the only solution is you've got to figure out a way to make more money and to maybe find more than one source of income, maybe two, three jobs. Or if they do something treacherous, you have two jobs. Um, okay, so, so they're going to raise taxes. Okay, now, how come people are going to put up with this? How come people are just going to be passive? Well, for one thing, you have to rely on the government to get your unemployment and your social security. And so these people don't want to kick up too much dust. Number two, if you have a good job of some sort, you don't want to kick up too much dust because you don't want to do anything to lose your job. So they're Im immobilizing the population and controlling the population at the lower end and at the mid-range where they're going to tax the life out of these people. Uh, uh, one estimate was if you have a $50,000 income, they're going to just raise your, um, your taxes by $5,000. That's 10%. And that would be probably lucky if that's the only thing that happens. But you got to be able to expect it. Okay, now, to, to immobilize the population and control the population, one of the things besides taxing would be to control and limit the hours so that you just barely have enough money to pay your bills. You'd be so stressed out, that's all you could do is just to get by. You're trying to survive. We go back to like the the depression sustenance. You're just trying to get it through this mess, saying to yourself, things will get better someday. You cannot wait for someday other people to make it better because they're not invested in you're getting better. They're invested in themselves. Like I've told you many examples by people I work for or rented from. And, and they would say something to the effect well, it is our right to give you a 30-day notice and give your apartment to our friend. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's true. Okay, and limit your hours or cut your hours. Okay, so if you cut everyone to part-time, then twice as many people have a job, but that is underemployment, and that's okay because you can just get food stamps and Social Security 
social services, which gives you a minimum poverty income, which is going to control people. Okay, so I mentioned to you they were um, about, this was about uh, in, in Germany in World War II, the, the Jewish people said, yeah, we knew it was coming, but, you know, we didn't think it was going to be that bad. Well, that's probably not what really happened. What really happened is to immobilize people, you give them, say, your option would be to evacuate the country like quick-like or not to evacuate the country and hope like hell you could survive. Both options are very dangerous, probably resulting in you getting killed. So most of the time people would be doing nothing. So the actions you could take like, um, like a migration to another area or just sitting there hoping for the best, both would cause so much stress that most of the time you would do nothing. Okay, so this over overwhelming um, amount of stress causes uh, helplessness and imm immobility. People just sit there and do nothing. I think we're seeing that. Okay. Now, this is a very, very important com uh, concept. In Nazi Germany, how did they get these Germans and these people to do all this unspeakable stuff? They scared the people. It was as simple as that. They scared the hell out of the people, and the people complied because they were very scared. And so if we start getting in situations of being extremely fearful, what we have to do is approach that one day at a time and say, well, wow, you know, this is really bad. But um, I have to work my way out of this. If I don't find a job, things are going to be so, so bad. If I don't get, if I don't live with somebody and share expenses right now, I could end up homeless. And the best thing to do is brainstorm with somebody. I did brainstorming on this channel and it really actually pissed people off. It's headachey. But if you do it long enough, you will come to a solution. There is this guy who was trying to help, and we brainstormed, you know, like for 45 minutes, came up with the conclusion that maybe this guy we knew would let him stay in the shed. And last time I saw him, he was under an umbrella up on Washington Street. Okay, so now about making people feel, feel unsafe. Okay, you know this explosion in Nashville? Now people are saying maybe there's a crazy, um, or maybe everybody in the country, maybe there's a crazy, maybe people are going to copycat this, and it gives that people that, um, that feeling of being unsafe, which makes them stay in the house, which immobilizes the person. So as we see these things happening, it, we need to put it into the back of our minds that this is paralyzing and immobilizing us, not to say we should do things that are unsafe. Okay, now we have evictions and homelessness looming. Okay, they're saying 40 million people are set to be evicted if this, uh, if this rent moratorium, 40 million people. So the dollar amount if you figure it out overall that most of them need is $6,000, they're saying people can be destabilized for as little as 200 to 400. So what you want to say to yourself is, okay, I need somewhere between 200 and $6,000 to stabilize myself next year. Um, these X, these, um, Evictions include utilities. They haven't been paying their utilities. 70 billion people, a huge, huge amount of people have maxed out our credit, their credit cards, which goes back to the, the um, paper thing. So what you want to do is you want to say, okay, this is very messed up, but maybe I can save one credit credit card that's going to give me at least two to four hundred dollars if I need it, God forbid. 
maybe I can go through my house and sell some stuff, um, you know, and so just start brainstorming. Maybe I can buy all the food marked down. Maybe I can get all my food at a food bank. Okay, so the credit cards are maxed out. P okay, so all of this is bad enough, but what happens if people start going hungry? That's why I do these, these stockpile videos. That's why I stockpile food. So if it came down to it, if all you could do is pay your rent, and so you need food, water, and a clean, dry place to sleep, it doesn't have to be that clean. It's better if you have heat. So if you paid your rent, um, but some people will will not be able to the function to the point of sustaining their uh, dwelling. So in that case, you need to consider like a car and drive to a warmer area. So we go back to the migration and start applying for Section 8 like now. Okay, so... Out here, what I'm seeing, and I find this very disturbing, I try to talk to them uh, myself, and uh, is I do understand, because having worked in these self-help groups, is young men, very young men, like um, between 15 and 25 homeless. And so you try to imagine, well, what kind of homes did these people come with? Well, they came from these these situations that I just described, maybe single moms, maybe the parents are incarcerated. One of the most counterproductive things would be getting incarcerated. When I was doing um, self-help, I can pretty much tell you the ineptitude of the parents caused a lot of uh, incarceration, you know, committing crimes. So, and there are simple things too, like collecting cans, like reselling junk, like saying, well, you know, Maybe today I can just, when I'm walking by, I have seen, we have Iraq stores, I have seen them come out of the store and offer people jobs. So, you know, just every single day say, I've got to find a job, I've got to find a job. I'm just going to end with one story. Okay, I was going to the Adventist church, and, and in the Adventist, they say you should have a small farm, and now... You know, now that this all has come about, I can see the wisdom of that. A small farm would be 10 acres. So, okay, in Southern California, you say, oh, yeah, where am I going to get $4 million? But, you know, you can start out smaller. So, okay, so there was this Adventist preacher, and he says, I, I have been told to get a farm, and I must get a farm. So he went to the, he found this farm, and he went to the bank, and he said to the banker, I would like to purchase this farm. And the banker said, you can't afford to purchase this farm. You're going to be back in here. You're going to lose this farm. And, and, the, and the pastor said, God has told me I'm to have a farm. And so the banker said, okay, but I know you're going to be back in here and you are going to lose your farm. So, okay, time went on and sure enough, he could not pay for his farm. And remember this if you're in foreclosure. And um, so he said to himself, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? You know, I cannot pay for my farm. God, I don't know what I'm going to do. And he got in his car. Now, I employed this so many times when I found jobs. I got in the car and I said, God, you're going to help me find a job. And so he got in his car and he said, God, I know you're going to help me. And you, he started to drive. And believe it or not, he drove to the bank. And he said to himself, I don't want to do this. I do not want to do this. But he, he said he had promised God that he would do anything he could. So he went into the banker and he said, you know, you, you are right. You are right. And I am about to lose my farm. And so I prayed to God and I asked God to help me. And I drove here. And is there anything you can do for me? And the banker sat there and the banker looked at him. And he didn't say anything for quite a while. I'm sure the poor guy, the poor minister. And all of his friends had said, you know, this is a sin of presumption. You can't afford this farm. You blah, blah, blah. So then after some time, the banker said, okay, I'm going to help you. And so what happened was, he had a farm when nobody else did. 
because he had faith in God. So a lot of religious people say that is the way we have to live. And, and I happen to agree with that. And many times when I didn't have a job or I had like big problems, I mean, I have had very bad problems in my life. And so I will end on that, you guys. I'm praying for you all. And if you would pray for my followers at night, you know, pray for each other. You never know who's, whose prayers are going to help you. Uh, one of the women I follow, Rambling of Sherry, please go to her channel. Give her some hearts. Give her some love and subscribe. Okay, you guys, please like, comment, and subscribe. And God bless you all.